so in the previous lectures uh, we were discussing how to analyze circuits intuitively so in that regard we were analyze we, we took a few bipolar junction transistor circuits uh, a single bipolar junction transistor circuit and we found how to find the looking in impedance at any node okay so the impedance is obviously between that node of interest and the ac ground the small signal ground so we we actually discussed several or, or rather uh, several topologies then we said if you understood how to find the looking in impedances for these simple configurations then you can analyze more or less any bipolar junction transistor circuit so keeping that in mind so today's lecture we'll discuss a little bit more uh, the general considerations in an amplifier and then uh, because as as i told you you are getting introduced to the amplifier for the first time so these ideas when we discuss it for the first time it might look as as a something that, that's very new but eventually when you start probably getting used to the subject and ideas in the course then um, it will all make perfect sense okay so first what we discuss when we talk about uh, amplification we use a word called small signal amplification which means if i am applying a small signal vi we say that the bjt in response to this generates a current given by gm times vi where gm is the transconductance of this device okay so it generates a proportional current um, and uh, that that proportionality of constant the, the, the constant of proportionality is actually gm okay now this uh, this is an approximation if you recall this this is actually an approximation what we are trying to find here this is this result here it's called as a small signal approximation but in reality if you look at it we know the transfer characteristics for this device the ic is alpha times is e power vbe by vt that's the exact expression so now instead of vi what i'm actually applying in the circuit there is a quiescent vbeq we discussed that we don't show the quiescent voltage generally on top of that there is also a small signal voltage which we are calling it as vi so this expression is actually i alpha is e power vb quiescent plus vi by vt okay so there is a factor called eta here but i have assumed it as 1 so yeah now this result if i just expand it i'll have something like this i i alpha i is e power vb quiescent by vt times e power vi by vt okay so this this is nothing but your quiescent collector current icq so this is the current the collector current at a fixed base emitter voltage so which is vbeq that multiplied by e power vi by vt so if i expand this result if i do a series expansion for this you get icq into 1 plus vi by vt plus vi by vt the whole square so it's it's use this e power x expansion so it will be 1 plus x plus x square by 2 factorial and so on so the general expression will be summed over uh, n goes from 0 to infinity you have x power n by n factorial so this is the so i mean expansion of series expansion of an exponential function so you will have a a large number of terms which are proportional to vi vi square and so on okay and higher order powers of vi so now if you look at the first term so what we have here is there is a dc current icq plus there is the quiescent current icq by vt into vi and uh, other terms you know this terms there these are all terms which are proportional to higher order powers of vi right they will be proportional to vi square vi cube and so on okay there is some constant here let me call that constant as some uh, alpha okay these are some constants okay alpha here is a constant it's not your uh, uh, beta by beta plus one it's just a constant okay so maybe in this example Uh, let me just write it for v square at least so you'll have icq upon vt square into vi square and so on now what we do in this analysis generally when we do the small signal analysis we assume the voltage signal vi is small enough it is small enough that i can ignore this higher order terms in comparison to this 
okay see look at it let's assume v is 1 millivolt 1 millivolt now this term 1 millivolt square is a much smaller number than 1 millivolt so the first term i mean this term is going to dominate compared to the second term okay for small signals so that's why we ignore this and we assume for small signals the collector current is given by the cuisson collector current plus this term icq by vt i'm going to call it as gm times vi so this is a small signal approximation but in reality in an actual circuit what you will actually see you, you will see a lot of nonlinear terms so these are called the nonlinear terms by now you know in signals and systems you have studied linear and linear systems so what's the how do you say if a system is linear or not if a system is linear what's your test for linearity how do you say yeah, additivity and homogeneity. So in terms of, uh, uh, rather in, in simpler terms, what, how do you, uh, yeah, it, it obeys superposition and all that. In simpler terms, if you increase your input by a factor, output should also increase by the same factor. Okay, that's your uh, homogeneity. Okay, if you increase your factor, I mean, in, increase your input by some factor alpha, output should also increase by the same factor. Now, what I'm going to do is that this, this term I, IC minus ICQ, I, I'll have a term called IC minus ICQ. This ideally is supposed to be equal to GMVI, right? IC minus ICQ, ICQ is your DC operating current, IC is the total collector current. The difference between that is your small signal collector current. So I'll call it delta IC. That's your small signal collector current. That is approximately equal to GMVI. So that's what we just saw right now. Now this current, this small signal collector current, is proportional to the input voltage. But what we have said just now is that in reality, it also depends upon higher order terms. So alpha, gamma, vi cube, and so on. It has dependence on higher powers of vi as well. Not just proportional to vi, but it's also proportional to vi squared and so on. Now you ideally want amplification. The word I would use rather for an amplifier is a linear amplifier. Meaning, if you apply a certain input sine wave, the output sine wave should preferably be an amplified version of the input sine wave. So that's what we mainly need. But what you will generate in reality, if you feed a sine wave to the system, now look at this, this is nonlinear system. If you had a system with a transfer function with a, with a characteristic given by vi square, if I feed a sine wave of frequency omega naught, what do you think will be the frequencies present in the output? Let's assume, let's take a simplest case. Let's say you have a system like this, y equals alpha x plus beta x square. This is a system given to you. Now to this system, I'm feeding x, the input x I'm feeding is cos omega naught t. If I feed cos omega naught t, what are the frequencies present in the output? So can I say it will be alpha cos omega naught t plus beta cos square omega naught t. Now expand cos square omega naught t. Yes, omega and 2 omega naught. Expand this. So what you, you get here is that cos omega naught t plus beta by 2 cos 2 omega naught t plus beta by 2. Right? I just expanded the cosine square function. Now if you see, you have fed a sine wave of frequency omega naught at the input. So this is a cosine signal. But uh, I'll just show it as a uh, sinusoid starting from zero. OK. And ideally, you are expecting to see an amplified version that probably looked something like this. But now you're also seeing some additional terms which were not present in the input. In fact, you're seeing a harmonic of the input. So that's one important property of a nonlinear system is that a nonlinear system will generate frequencies which are not present in the input. Okay, if you take a linear time invariant system, an LTI system, an LTI system will obey a few properties. One, it will provide the property of linearity, which is if I increase my input by a certain factor, output should also increase only by the same factor. The second thing about linearity is that it's a consequence of linearity. Uh, if, if your input frequency, if your input signal has a frequency omega naught, 
output signal should also have the same frequency omega naught. It should not contain any other frequencies. Okay, so such systems are linear systems. But what you see here in practice, you'll also see some second harmonic. So this is like you know in one half cycle, your signal undergoes one full cycle. So this is the second harmonic. This this is two omega naught. So you'll have some second harmonic component as well. Similarly, had I included V i cube, if I include a term some gamma times x cube, you should logically expect a term. What what frequency do you think will be present if I assume x cube, three omega naught, right? So you should expect three omega naught. So it will undergo three cycles. Within one cycle, it will undergo three cycles. So you should expect three omega naught to be present. Now the signal of interest is omega naught. This is the one. The signal of omega frequency omega naught is the signal of interest to you. All these additional frequencies are unwanted components. So these are all unwanted in the system. Okay. So this is what we call nonlinear distortion. So this is better appreciated if you think of a music, right? Most of you know high pitch, low pitch. If you have a high pitch signal, you know how it sounds, and a low pitch signal, you know how it sounds. So let's assume you have a purely nonlinear amplifier and you want to amplify an audio signal. In the process of amplifying, your audio, ideally your amplifier is supposed to amplify the signal of the, uh, amplify the audio signal which you are applying. Let's say you use a device called a harmonium. A harmonium can generate pure sine to tones, very close to very close sine wave tones. Okay. Now at the output, you would expect to hear the same signal back, but instead you will start hearing a high pitch voice or a high pitch signal. So that is distortion. We don't want that, right? You know, you want an amplified version of the input. You don't want to hear something else. So anything other than that is anything other than the main signal component. It's an unwanted component. So we go, we are going to call this process. Your signal is now distorted at the output. Okay. Ideally, you are expecting a pure sine wave, but because of this, it, your sine wave shape will look a little different because of some high frequency content. You are expecting a pure sine wave like this, but what you will receive is some shape like this. So this is called nonlinear distortion. This is distortion. Your output signal looks very different from the input signal. In shape, it looks very different. If I apply a sine wave, and that's because of the system nonlinearities. So this is called nonlinear distortion. Now let's look back. Let's go back and look at this expression. This is your bipolar junction transistors. We, I mean, small signal cu signal current as a function of the input voltage. So far in the analysis, we only assumed the first term. We did. We said the second terms can be ignored. That can be ignored if your input voltage V i is really small. Okay. If your input voltage V i is really small, how small? That's the question you'll have to uh, answer. So maybe if I give you a hint like this. If I want to approximate, yes, that's right. That's right. So I think one of you got it. So if you want to approximate e power x to approximately 1 plus x, what is the condition for that? You need mod of x to be less than 1, right? If your x is less than 1, then you know that you can make a linear approximation for an exponential function. So if you look at your exponential function, OK, at any given point, I mean, uh, for example, at the origin, you can see this function will have a slope very close to it will look like a linear function like this if you draw a straight line it will overlie it will overlap with it near the origin so for you to satisfy this condition you need to have vi by vt that's your exponential term that should be less than 1 so if your vi is in the order of vt vt is 25 millivolts 30 millivolts small signal i'm talking about small signal vi you're fine if let's say your vi is 1 millivolt you know that you are much smaller than 25 millivolts, so you are fine. So you won't experience much nonlinearities. If it is not, then the second terms will start dominating. Okay, so that's called nonlinear distortion. So now, see, as an engineer, your task is to design an amplifier. But your the question that you should ask yourself is that: Will it amplify any signal that I apply? Now let's assume I'm just going to apply a sinusoid and then I'm going to look at the output and I mean rather I want an amplified, I'm, I'm expecting an amplified version of the sine wave at the output. This is what I'm ideally expecting. I haven't put any restriction on what should be the amplitude of the sine wave. I haven't put any restriction so far. 
okay we just said small signal and we left it now from the preceding analysis one thing become one thing is clear to you that for you to get faithful amplification meaning if you apply a sine wave at the input your output should also be the same sine wave of the same frequency but an amplified version amplitude should amplitude should be larger for that to happen it's now clear to you that your input signal should be very small i mean it should be smaller than bt but it should be very small what happens as your input your input signal starts increasing what do you think happens as your input starts increasing so if i incremental model fails and also not, not only that see look at the large signal picture itself you get distortion see look at the first term i'll i'll draw the first term if i increase my input signal the first term increases with a with a slope of gm right it's proportional to gm right then i'm plotting delta ic versus vi and see here i'm plotting delta ic not ic but delta ic the uh, the small signal the signal part of the current this has a slope of this is gm vi term this is gm vi term what about alpha vi square alpha vi square starts off very low but after a point that will start increasing you get it this term can start becoming greater than vi square after a certain value of input so what can what we can say intuitively is that so uh, sorry so what you can say intuitively is that alpha vi square term will look like this gamma vi cube it it will eventually cross vi square also it will eventually because they'll all increase but at much faster rates right this is increasing proportional to vi cube vi cube this is increased proportional to vi square and so on so if you increase the input amplitude this nonlinear terms will increase significantly okay so that's the major problem with us so there is a limitation if as i keep on increasing my input signal say from 1 millivolts to 10 millivolts to 100 millivolts and so on to to let's say 1 volt and so on you will start experiencing significant distortion after a point what will happen is ideally you will expect a sine wave that you want to amplify an amplified version you might end up seeing some other frequency completely dominating in your output this is a second harmonic so this is a second harmonic you will end up seeing that starting to dominate and for example i told you to consider a voice signal a low pitch versus high pitch you will end up hearing a complete high pitch voice you gave a low pitch signal and you end up hearing a high pitch signal in return so then th that's no longer faithful amplification right so that's called so the term we are interested in is linear amplification so this linear amplification okay uh, yeah so that is normally done low, low pass filtering is normally done okay but uh, even if you have low pass filtering if your amplitude is already high to begin with input amplitude is already high to begin with non linear terms you can't filter out after a point yeah the low pass filtering is something we do as well yeah so let me finish this so what i'm trying to say is that one can intuitively see that this amplifier cannot work after a certain value of input meaning there is a problem if i keep increasing the input amplitude okay so there is a limit on maximum value of vi do you see this if i keep increasing vi what's going to happen the second the nonlinear terms will start dominating so these terms alpha vi square alpha gamma vi cube these terms will these terms will start dominating i've shown it in the graph here because they grow much faster when they start dominating you will no longer be that the amplification will no longer be a linear or faithful amplification you will start seeing some other frequencies in the output which you didn't even want in the first place okay so then intuitively we can see that there is an upper limit of vi i cannot exceed a certain value of vi if i want faithful amplification okay so there is an upper limit so i mean for example let's assume 100 millivolts is your upper limit so this is your vi max i'm just taking an example 100 millivolts for a simple common emitter bjt similarly is there any lower limit what is the minimum value of vi that i can apply now first if i start reducing vi what do you think will happen to linear distortion non linear distortion will it reduce or will it increase if i keep reducing vi reduce right if i keep reducing the input voltage then the non linear distortion will start reducing 
okay the nonlinear distortion will start reducing if you reduce vi now so then ideally one should think that okay if i apply a 1 millivolt signal then i should have better amplification because there will be lesser unwanted harmonics and if i go for 1 microvolt so i think milli micro so milli is 10 power minus 3 micro 10 power minus 6 nano 10 power minus 9 pico 10 power minus 12 femto is 10 power minus 15 atto is 10 power minus 18 okay i think these are the numbers we will typically encounter in this course so i've given the numbers so just just keep this in mind okay so if i take a one microvolt signal if i apply a one microvolt signal to this amplifier do you think you will still get a faithful amplification if i keep reducing the input signal what problems do you think that might be present in the system see one thing is clear signal will be very small yes but see one thing is upper limit is clear for you output is not as amplified as you want no the problem is um, let me put some cascade of amplifiers let me put four or five cascade of amplifiers we can put cascade and get sufficient gain see your goal is this at the let's say at the output you want a one volt sine wave a one volt sine wave if i apply 100 millivolts you would want a gain of 10 if i apply 1 millivolt you will want a gain of 1000 if i apply 1 microvolt then you know that i mean see when i say apply you will generally know what is the level of voltages that you will receive from that you can predict what is the amplification necessary you can roughly guess what will be the amplification factor you will need so i'll need 10 power 6 okay and also i told you guys now from now onwards you should start getting used to using logarithms so 10 if i have a gain of 10 what is it in decibels a gain of 10 what is it in decibels so 20 log of the gain right so 20 decibels yeah so if it is gain of 10 it is 20 decibels so 10 cube what will be that in decibels 60 decibels okay 10 power 6 is 120 decibels so this is 20 decibels 60 and 120 okay so that's how you see this amplification um, amp amplification fa amplifi amplification factor or gain can be expressed in terms of decibels as well okay now yeah so this is uh, so we, we just discussed there is an upper limit and what about the lower limit so that's what we are discussing now what is there any lower limit on the input voltage that i can apply I think one of you wrote it, it's actually noise. Noise determines what is the minimum level that you can apply. Okay. So noise, almost all circuits that we build in practice is limited by noise. Okay. Even a resistor, if you, for example, if you took a two terminal resistor, if you apply a voltage and expect a current, let's say you apply a DC voltage, then the current of value, say one volt, and a resistance of one kilo ohm, you will be expecting a constant DC current of one milliampere. Okay. Now, if I plot this current as a function of time, and you have applied one millivolt, so ideally you would expect one milliampere of current. But on top of that, you will also see some very small variations in the order of micro or nano amperes. Very small variations. Okay. So these variations. Or called this, this process is called thermal noise. We will discuss more about noise in the next semester's course on ADVD. Noise is something that's very fundamental to analog circuits. Okay, so noise will dictate what is the minimum signal level that you can apply. After a point, if you keep reducing your input signal, your noise will start submerging your input signal. At some point, your signal will get buried in noise. At that point, you can no longer hear your signal. Amplifier will amplify both noise and your signal. So therefore, you'll no longer be able to hear your signal. So what you'll hear is pure noise. So even now, let's say what you're hearing is my voice plus some background noise. Now, as I keep lowering my voice, at some point, you'll start hearing the background noise and you'll no longer hear my voice. Okay, so that's the problem of noise. So here for an amplifier, what we have discussed right now, there are two, para two things which determine the performance of an amplifier one on the lower end the minimum signal you can apply is typically determined by noise 
the maximum signal level that you can apply is determined by nonlinear distortion. Okay, so nonlinearities will determine nonlinear distortion or nonlinearities will determine what is the maximum signal you can apply and uh, linear when the minimum signal that you can apply is determined by noise once your signal is submerged in noise then there is no point in uh, reducing your signal level further okay you will not be able to hear your signal at all so usually there is a term called dynamic range we uh, uh, we'll talk about dynamic range in next semester of course but just to give you an idea dynamic range tells you the range it's it's like the minimum and maximum voltage that you can apply to the system so uh, most of the terms normally we express dr is dynamic range expressed in decibels so typically if you take voltage it is expressed in 20 log of v max by v min this is the simplest definition okay so uh, it might be slightly more involved but this is the simplest definition the maximum input you can apply to the minimum input that you can apply as long as there is a faithful amplification okay so if i told you there was 100 millivolts is the maximum and one microvolt is the minimum what will be your dynamic range no is it 60 100 100 decibels yes it's 100 decibels so 20 log of 100 millivolts 100 millivolts so 100 into 10 power minus 3 by 1 microvolt is 10 power minus 6 so it will be 10 power 5 so 10, 10 10 cube into 10 square it will be 10 power 5 it will 100 okay that's it. so that's how you compute dynamic range okay so now we have if i want to increase dynamic range see, ideally you want the amplifier to amplify even for large signals as well you don't want to restrict the signal levels now in this uh, in a in an advanced course we will talk about more techniques on how to deal with nonlinearity right now i'm going to explain a simpler circuit so which is why i, I introduced the idea of nonlinearity right now so how do we is there a way to quickly address this problem of nonlinearity so we said that if let's say we build a common emitter amplifier if you build a common emitter amplifier and what is the maximum if and i connect a load resistance rl and assume rl is much smaller than r naught you can ignore r naught for the time being what is the small signal voltage gain for this v naught is the voltage what is the small signal voltage gain minus gm rl is that right so minus of gm rl see when you apply a signal vi you have a small signal current gm vi flowing in this direction you have a small signal current GMVI flowing in this direction. So I told you guys, you can also write it as minus GMVI flowing in the opposite direction. So when it flows through RL, it will create a voltage drop of GMRL into VI. So the voltage gain is minus GMRL. But the problem with this amplifier, it's highly nonlinear. So if I increase my input signal, I'm, go I'm going to get a lot more additional terms. Your V0 will not just be minus GMRL times VI. It will also have some terms which are proportional to uh, vi square vi cube and so on okay so this is nonlinear distortion now what we will do is that we will add a resistance in series with the emitter terminal okay so what, what i mean what can you say about a resistor is a resistor a linear device is a resistor a linear device so if i apply a voltage vi Yes, right. So the current will always be proportional to VI. It's always proportional to VI. Okay. It has no nonlinear dependence on the input voltage. Now, if I can somehow make the collector current, if I can somehow make the collector current here, see, right now the collector current is dependent on the BJT's current, right? So when I say the collector current in the previous case was GMVI, GM is a device dependent parameter, it depends on the BJT. Right? It's a BJT dependent parameter. And also the gain, voltage gain happens to be GM times RL, transconductance times RL. So when you fabricate a BJT, the numbers might change. Okay, the numbers might change from one BJT to other BJT. So if you have minus GM RL as your voltage gain, 
that gain is prone to variations if your gm changes then the gain will also change okay this is two problems one is nonlinearity because your current is dependent on gm second thing is variation in gain your gain can also vary if your transconductance changes so if to know two bjt's are identical you can never fabricate two bjt's perfectly identical okay so that's there is we will later talk about a idea called mismatch in the course so devices will eventually have mismatch two devices will never be same so if you are making a million units of a bjt all the bjt's will not have the same properties you know there will be some small deviation so normally that is characterized separately before a chip before a product is sold in the market a bjt chip is sold so they'll generally characterize a lot so you'll have some millions of bjt's which will undergo rigorous tests before they are sold into production so that's why no two bjt's will be same so as i said the transconductance can vary so if you are manufacturing 1 million radio units using these bjt's what all i'm trying to say is the gms will vary from bjt to bjt so therefore the gain will vary from radio to radio okay so those changes can come so here the problem is your gain is dependent on gm which is a bjt parameter can we make this gain independent of gm so that should be our thought process next to make that if i can somehow make this current the collector current let's say if, if i can somehow make the collector current proportional to some resistance vi by r proportional to some resistance then i know that it's a linear device so then i can more or less expect the collector current to uh, be linear okay so that should be my thought process we know resistor is linear if i somehow make your collector current depend on resistance so it, it if it of if it is of this type vi by some resistance then maybe i will actually have a linear amplifier so in that case what do you think will be the voltage gain the voltage gain if i apply if i assume that your current is vi by r what will be your voltage gain let's say i connect your load resistance here i connect a load resistance here yeah so your load your gain will be minus of so let's assume your collector current is some vi by r equal to vi by r so it will be minus of rl by r so it's now ratio of two resistors okay so generally these resistors are external resistors so i'm i'm talking about discrete ic design okay in in an integrated circuit you will be manufacturing resistors on chip so last semester um, in your course on the physics of semiconductor devices they must have discussed about how a resistor is made on a semiconductor what are the properties of a semiconductor resistor right the resistance depends on or the conductance depends on mobility uh, the doping concentration okay they depend mostly on mobility and doping concentration so if you want to uh, increase the resistance what will you do reduce the resistance what will you do right so what will be the conductivity dependent dependent on if you if you take a n type or a p type semiconductor and dope it with this uh, uh, i mean if you keep increasing your doping concentration you will have more carriers which will participate in conduction right so if you dope it with a certain impurity you will have more see uh, this is a simple result i'll just spend 2 minutes explaining this we'll come back to uh, our discussion on amplifiers again if you take a silicon atom if you take pure intrinsic silicon what is the value of ni what what does ni tell you ni what does ni tell you what is intrinsic carrier concentration what does it mean so if i take a bar of silicon pure silicon okay this is pure intrinsic silicon and i'm applying a voltage okay see if i let's assume i have a metal and a metal has say an atomic density so there is atomic density of metal uh, atoms per centimeter cube i'm going to give you a number let's assume you have a metal with one valence electron the metal has only one uh, valence electron so let's assume that metal has something of this order 5 into 10 power 23 or 22 22 atoms per centimeter cube this is the number of atoms so what will be the number of carriers or number of electrons available for conduction if i apply a voltage source how many electrons do you think will participate in conduct conduction all right all all the electrons almost every atom will have an electron most of them will participate in conduction the metal will give you almost 5 to 10 to power 23 atoms 
now if you take silicon let's assume silicon is a semiconductor it's neither a conductor nor an insulator okay if you take silicon silicon atomic density is 5 into 10 to the power 22 atoms per centimeter cube if you take pure intrinsic silicon you will find if you take 1 centimeter cube chunk of silicon you will find so many atoms 5 into 10 to the power 22 atoms out of these atoms silicon has four valence electrons but how many do you think participate in conduction at room temperature so that will be ni right intrinsic carrier concentration ni is the number of electrons or holes which will participate in conduction that will be in the order of 1.5 into 10 power 10 okay 1.5 into 10 power 10 1.5 into 10 power 10 is the number of electrons or holes which are available for conduction. Okay, so that's why silicon will give you only this much. Look at the conductivity difference. Number of carriers here is like 10 power 12 times larger. I mean, um, I'm just giving an order uh, 10th power comparison. It's almost 10 power 12 times larger. So that's why metal is a much better conductor or whatever this material is, this is much better conductor. Now what we'll do is we'll, do, we'll dope the material. Once I dope the material, let's say I add 10 power 16 dopant atoms. 10 power 16 is still a small number. What is 10 power 16? You have 5 into 10 power 22 atoms per centimeter cube. You take one centimeter cube chunk of silicon, you have 5 into 10 power 22 silicon atoms. And in that, you are diffusing some, or rather, you're introducing some 10 power 16 per centimeter cube, 10 power 16 dopant atoms now just compare what is the ratio of these two ratio of these two will be 5 into 10 power 6 so this is number of silicon atoms number of maybe assume it's a n-type semiconductor phosphorus atoms or whatever the pentavalent impurities so which means for every one phosphorus atom you have 5 million silicon atoms so if you look at this if you take this one centimeter cube silicon chunk and cut it into 5 million silicon atom chunks cut it into smaller cubes with 5 million silicon atoms, you will have one phosphorus atom corresponding to that. That's like nothing. So that's why it's called as an impurity. It's such, small, it's such low in quantity so that none of the properties of silicon gets affected. You assume the same band gap, everything, affinity, electron affinity, everything remains the same for silicon. So even if you dope it, you assume all those properties to remain the same. It's a different material. Right? Once you dope it, there are different impurity atoms in it. It's no longer intrinsic silicon, but we assume all the parameters are same. Doping, I mean, sorry, the band gap, uh, the the work function, the uh, affinity, and all of that. We assume all those parameters remain unchanged. Okay, so that's why it's called an impurity. It's such small quantities. For five million silicon atoms, I'm adding one phosphorus atom. So if you take, if you see your silicon. Uh, if you take one centimeter cube silicon chunk and cut them into five million cube, uh, sorry, five million. Uh, silicon atom cubes, each cube is going to contain just one phosphorus atom. But still, that one phosphorus atom is going to give away that one extra electron that it has for conduction at room temperature. So the moment you dope it, now at room temperature, you will have nearly 10 power 16 electrons available for conduction. Now see, before doping, the pure intrinsic silicon had only 1.5 to 10 power 10. That was just the number of electrons you had for conduction. If you apply the voltage, these many electrons will participate in conduction. But now I have increased the number of electrons that can participate in conduction by 10, several orders. It's by 10 power, a million times, right? 10 power 6. I've increased it by 10 power 6. So that's why semiconductors have such huge advantage. You take silicon, dope it, you can convert it into a very good conductor. So here the number of electrons, the carrier concentration increases significantly. Or you oxidize silicon. You take silicon and oxidize it, it becomes an insulator. SiO2 is a very good insulator. Insulator will have even smaller electrons. I mean, it is not even 10 power 10. It will be in the order of 10 or 10 square and so on. The number of electrons that will be available for conduction will be in the order of 10, 10 square and so on. So that will be much smaller. Okay, that's why silicon is still so popular and it's abundant. Not only that, it's semiconductor is popular. Semiconductor, you can do that. But silicon, it's abundant and it's also very popular. So keep this in mind. Now we'll come back to our discussion. Uh, 
yeah so resistance i was talking about how a resistor is built so this is how you build a resistor if you want a certain resistance value you know that it will it will be inversely proportional to the doping concentration na or nd okay the doping concentration so if you increase or decrease your doping concentration you can change your value of resistance accordingly what does resistance also depend upon if you to take a a semiconductor what does resistance depend upon length and cross sectional area right it's rho l upon a it depends on length cross sectional area and resistivity or l by sigma a your conductivity this conductivity sigma depends on how many your mobility and the number of carriers you have for conduction okay so that depends upon it so i can tweak all these parameters and design a resistor on chip so on chip resistors are in, i've described the simplest way of building a resistor so right now see it's been almost several decades of progress in ic ic fabrication and ic techno ic technique ic techniques itself so therefore there are better materials which can give you very accurate resistances so that's that's what we use now but in a very simplistic way this is good enough for understanding okay so we know that you can build an ic resistor integrated resistor using an n type or a p type semiconductor so now we'll come back to this generally what happens is that we said if i can make my current small signal current delta ic proportional to the input voltage that is it depends on the resistor then we said if i pass this current we can get a gain which is minus of rl by r so generally even resistors vary even resistors vary they might you might you might have fabricated a certain value of resistance but what you actually will see might be still little off from your predictions maybe let's say it's both resistance is off by 5% then your gain will also be off by 5% we don't want that we want the gain to be remaining constant now if you see since it's a ratio of two resistors let's say both the resistors generally have a similar trend both the resistors increase by 5% so 1.5 1.05 1 times rl by 1.05 times r so the gain still remains the same it will see be same as rl by r so these are the two advantages one we make the system more linear if i make it dependent on resistor second gain also remains constant so gain constant and linear both these things can be achieved simultaneously if i go for emitter degeneration so if i connect an emitter resistance re here and a load resistance at this point okay then if i build a circuit like this what will be your character current i have already derived this result in the first or second or third lectures i don't remember on bjt's we have derived it if you ignore r not what will be your character current dependent on do you recall the control system block diagram model that we drew we drew a block diagram you you guys recall that yeah so what will be the value i mean it won't be gm obviously because there is an re present see if you take a simple mosfet a bjt directly and apply a voltage vi across it entirely then you get gmvi now what's happening here you have vi see we if all if if i can find what is vbe previously the vbe was vi this was equal to vi now vbe is no longer vi it's actually a small factor of fraction of vi it is actually a small fraction of vi see can i write it this way the input voltage is the total voltage across vbe so your vi equals vbe plus i'll approximate it to ic into re see i'll assume alpha is close to 1 if alpha is close to 1 the emitter current ie is also approximately equal to ic so the voltage across re is i ic into re yeah that's right that's right i'll i'll, I'll come to that so your vi equals vbe plus ic into re now vi vbe we know that ic is nothing but gm times vbe right this is something we know vbe is the unknown voltage ic is simply gm times vbe i'll just take few minutes and then i think i'll finish it so your 
this voltage will be VBE plus I, I'll substitute IC with GM VBE. I'll get GM RE into VBE. So what happens to your VI equals VBE into 1 plus GM RE. So your VBE, the input voltage is a small fraction of the base emitter voltage is now. Previously, the VBE was equal to VI itself. Now your VBE is actually a small fraction of the input voltage. So what is the voltage across the resistor RE? If I ask you what is our voltage across the resistor RE? VRE is simply IC into RE, which will be GM RE into VBE. If IC is GM VBE. You substitute VBE in this result. What do you get? GMRE upon 1 plus GMRE into VI. Now, if I assume GMRE is much greater than 1, if I assume GMRE is much greater than 1, what do you think will be the voltage across the resistor RE? If I assume GMRE to be much greater than 1, it will be VI itself. This factor will become 1, it will be VI itself. So once you know VI, what is the current flowing through the resistor RE then? If I ask you in terms of VI, voltage across it is VI. What is the current? The emitter current in the circuit. VI by RE. The current is VI by RE. The IE itself. Your collector current also becomes, sorry, this is capital RE. Sorry. This is, so VI upon capital RE. VI upon capital R. That's it. We just got what we wanted. Now, if you see your collector current depends mainly on the emitter resistance. Okay. So it is now VI upon RE. So what will be your output voltage? The output voltage is minus of RL upon RE into VI. Approximate result. This is an approximation again. This is what you get. So by doing this, what I have accomplished now is that I have built a linear amplifier by opting for emitter degeneration. Is that clear? What do you think is the problem? Do you see any problem with this approach? Do you lose anything here? See, previously the gain was, yes, amplification factor. What's happening to the amplification factor? Previously, the gain was GMRE. Now the gain is GM by 1 plus GMRE into RL. Right? This is an exact expression. This is an exact expression. I've written a more of an exact expression here. GMRL into this. Now this factor, if GMRE is much greater than 1, this reduces to minus 1 by RE. Okay? So, but now it is definitely going to be smaller than GM. So, GM by 1 plus GM RE, it's going to be smaller than GM. So, the gain is reduced. We lose somewhat in the gain. Okay. Voltage gain is reduced, but in return, we get a constant gain and also a linear amplifier. So, that's the advantage of emitter degeneration. Okay. I'll stop at this point. Uh, I'll have to solve your... Uh, yeah. I'll stop at this point. I think we'll uh, discuss the remaining on the one.